Hello and welcome to lesson 4.1 on three forms of quadratics. So, uh, in the last video, 4.0, we talked about factoring, right? Uh, and we talked about general methods of factoring uh, for polynomials. And we did single polynomials, which is like a letter like X. We did multivariable, maybe it had like X and Y in it, right? And we talked about different factoring methods like GCF, factor by grouping, uh, factoring quadratic trinomials, right? Um, and so that's that lesson was just to enhance the skill of factoring because it's something that we need and use with quadratic equations. Uh, and so the study of unit four, which is what this whole playlist is about, uh, is the study of quadratics. So they say, what is a quadratic? Quadratic is x squared, or the parent function you could say is y equals x squared. This makes our sort of u shape like this, it's called a parabola. That's actually not a very good, more like, uh, a little bit more like that, I guess. A little kind of a sharper turn there, yeah? So um, we, we kind of know some stuff about the parabola, either from algebra one, or from some of the stuff with transformations that we did in unit one, but this unit, is really about taking a deep dive into quadratics. And this first lesson is talking about the way we write quadratics. So there's three, uh, three ways we can express a quadratic equation. Uh, and those three forms are given here that I'm kind of highlighting with my pen here, yeah? Uh, and so in this video, I'm going to talk about the three forms uh, what the benefits of each form is, like what information can you infer for if you are given a particular form. Uh, and then as we go through the video, we're going to talk about how do you get from one form to the other, right? How do you write in between forms? Uh, because each of these expressions, right, the way you write this, uh, they all represent the same function, so they all generate the same parabola. Oh... Um, I apologize. It says, <laughs> you may have seen something, a message from Erica Spake that said, uh, it was you. And she is saying, it was you because, well, we were keeping a TikTok streak. Uh, and I, I told her, uh, let me go ahead and silence my notifications here. Uh, I, I told her that you lost the streak right? Because you didn't say, we, you know, we had like 140 days or something like that. Um, and she was like, no, it was, it was you, Evan. And I said, oh, okay. Maybe it was me. Maybe I forgot to send her a TikTok. Anyway, okay, no more interruptions. Let us proceed back to where we were. No, <laughs> no more distractions. As I was saying, uh, we have these three forms and they each tell us something about the parabola, uh, graphically or something, a feature about the function. Uh, so the first one is actually vertex form. Uh, and so this says y equals, I mean, it's, it says it right there, right? But I'm sort of highlighting it in my red pen here. y equals a times x minus h squared plus k. This should look familiar. Let me zoom in here, right? If you remember unit one, when we talked about function transformations, right? We said that function transformations were of the form a, f of b times x minus c, plus D, right? Uh, and so uh, something I asked in class was, hey, if you said two absolute value X plus one minus three, how would you interpret these transformations? Well, you'd say, well, we did the absolute value unit. We've done transformations before. We would say that the two causes a vertical stretch. We'd say that the plus one goes left one and the minus three goes down three. Now, of course, this is for an absolute value function, but what if I change it? Uh, let me say I take away these bars and I just make it a quadratic function now. Boop. So it's all the same transformations, vertical stretch, left one, down three, but it's about a parabola now, not a V shape because it's not absolute value now, right? Uh, but it's the same transformations. And you say, well, look at this. Look at what I've written here and compare it to this form, which is called vertex form. And you might say, oh, wait a minute, this is familiar. All vertex form is, 
is my function transformations, right? Um, but I'm not really doing C and D now. For some reason, we've, we're using these letters H and K. You might be saying, Mr. Spake, why do that? Why did you change the letters? I say, well, I don't know. Uh, if you look into a standard Algebra 2 textbook, pretty much every source uh, that's out there says that this is how we write vertex form, where, and let me clean this up so you can see it, uh, look at my little highlighter, where h comma k is the vertex of the parabola, yeah? Uh, I, I tried looking it up. I, I really don't know why we chose those letters, but I actually kind of like it. I think it's memorable. Uh, so there it is, yeah? Um, h comma k is the vertex of the parabola, and this makes sense because, you know, if I had 2 times x plus 1 squared minus 3... Well, left one, down three, if I were to sketch this parabola, left one, down one, two, three, well, hey, that key point that got transferred was the vertex, right? So the transformations left, right, up, down literally tell me where the vertex is, hence why this is called vertex form. Uh, and sometimes if we're, you know, we're working with problems uh, a common thing we're going to be interested in doing is finding the maximum. So, uh, like if I have a quadratic that looks like this, right? I want to find the maximum of something. Maybe it's a maximum height uh, or, or something like that, uh, or maximum profit, you know? Uh, and so vertex form would help us figure that out. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, then we have standard form. Standard form is... You should recognize this from Algebra 1. Uh, this is the standard way to write polynomials, yeah? Uh, so we say, what is a polynomial? Well, we talked about that in the last video, but as a reminder, it's basically just variable expressions where the variables have whole number exponents, meaning positive number exponents. Um, so for example, this is a polynomial because it's x squared, x to the 1, and the last term is actually x to the 0, because anything to the power of 0, we say, is 1, right? Although there are, you know, 0 to the power of 0, this is up for debate, uh, but Mr. Spakes agrees with the part of the math community that says it's 1, so anyway, anyway, whatever. We're not going to get into semantics here. x to the power of 0 is 1, so... Uh, we don't actually need that x there because x to the power of 0 is 1, so 1 times c. Well, duh, that's just c. We don't have to write that, yeah? And polynomials, just as uh, polynomials are kind of always written of this form of descending powers. So, like, if you had a cubic polynomial, it'd be ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. You know, if you had a quartic, meaning power of 4, you say ax to the 4th plus bx cubed plus cx squared plus dx plus e. You see, you see the pattern here, right? This is the standard way to write polynomials. So we call it the standard form of a quadratic. Um, and you'll notice uh, that in a quadratic, the highest power term is 2, x squared, right? We don't go beyond that because if we do, well, then we're not quadratic anymore, right? It's quadratics, parabolas are defined by having the highest power be x squared. Uh, another, uh, just a couple things to note about this form. Uh, this letter a, we call this the leading coefficient. Uh, and because we call it the leading coefficient because like I said, the standard way to write these polynomials is in sort of decreasing power order. Uh, so, you know, we would put that at the front every time, hence that's why it's called the leading coefficient. Now look, if you wrote 2 plus 4x squared, and I asked you, what's the leading coefficient? You would say that the leading coefficient is 4. Because what the leading coefficient really is, it is the coefficient on the highest power term. Yeah? So this 4x squared, this 4 would be, even though it's not in front, we would really maybe prefer to write it this way. It's just the standard way to do it. Yeah? It's not wrong if you do it the other way. Uh, the other piece of information here is this information about plus c. Uh, 0 comma c, so that c value, is the y-intercept of your function. Uh, let me show you this in Desmos here. 
Uh, I'm just going to type up a quick quadratic polynomial. Uh, so I'm going to choose 5 for my c value here, right? Uh, so you can see what I've typed over there on the left side is plus 5. Look at where the y-intercept is. Boop. It's at, it's at 0, 5, right? Uh, and if I change this to a 7, boop, it's at a 7. And even if I manipulate the coefficients on these other terms, let's say that's 6x squared. Maybe this is like uh, plus, uh, let's just say x, right? Still, the y-intercept is 7. So that constant term is at the end of your polynomial is always the y-intercept. And actually, this is true for all polynomials. So you know how I was just talking about x cubed and blah, 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 blah? Uh, that constant term at the end, whether it's c or d or whatever, that's always the y-intercept of a polynomial. And you might ask, why is that, Mr. Spake? I mean, okay, cool, I see that with Desmos, but for what reason? I said, well, what's a y-intercept again? Well, a y-intercept is when a graph crosses the y-axis, and on the y when you're on the y-axis, the point is zero comma some y-value, right? Because I don't know how high that is, but I do know that the x-coordinate is zero. And if you evaluate a polynomial at zero, you say f of zero, well, then that's a times zero squared plus b times zero plus c. Well, a times zero, gone, b times zero, gone. So all what are you left with? c, right? And this wouldn't change if it was ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d, because if you plug in zero for the y-intercept, this is gone, this is gone, this is gone. So the constant term that's added is always the y-intercept uh, for a standard form polynomial. Uh, just a little heads up, and that might actually help us uh, later on in unit five uh, and so forth. Uh, last one here is factored form. And by the way, I'm just, I'm just talking at length about these forms, right? What, what can you gain from these forms? How do we read them? Uh, I mean, it's just stuff like that. You're just really just listening. <laughs> uh, so factored form tells us something in particular uh, about your quadratic polynomial or your function. Um, so when you factor a polynomial, right, uh, like, like x squared plus 7x plus uh, 10, right, and you can factor this as x plus 5, x plus 2, uh, we learned the factoring techniques in the last lesson on how to get from here to here. Uh, but why is this useful and what does it tell us about a graph? I say, well, look, why don't I type that in, right? Let me go to Desmos. Let me show you. Uh, I'll do the one I just did, x squared plus 7x plus 10, right? Oop, that's 100. And I'll kind of zoom out here. I'll look at the graph. Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, and so you see this, you say, well, that's great, Mr. Spake. Uh, remind me what factored form is. I say, okay, student, uh, x plus 5, x plus 2 gets me this. Notice the factors, right? x plus 5, x plus 2. And where are the x-intercepts? Click, click. Hmm. My x-intercepts are at negative 5 and negative 2. So it seems like they're just the opposite signs of what's kind of going on in the factors, right? Uh, so what that means is, uh, if I said x minus a negative 5, negative 5 is the x-intercept, and so it's appearing as a factor x plus 5, right? Uh, same goes for the 2. It's x plus 2, but it's actually saying x minus negative 2. Negative 2 is the x-intercept, right? Um, so what factored form tells you is where the x-intercepts of a quadratic is. But maybe more particular, or uh, maybe, I, I, I don't know what the word would be, not better, just uh, more general, I guess, for general functions and not just parabolas. Factored form tells you something called the roots of a function. So if you, and this is true for all um, polynomial functions, if you completely factor it, you know what the roots of that polynomial are. And you say, well, okay, great, Mr. Spake, but what's a root? And I say, well, I have a de definition down here. 
definition, and where's my little highlighter? Boop, highlighter, definition. Oh my goodness, I would just, I would just see this. Oh, look at all the, the yellow, just constantly the yellow is getting more and more yellow, right? Mr. Spake is highlighting this because it is extremely important. This is a definition I want you to know, I need you to know. I'm gonna use this word a million times in this class. We're gonna talk about this word all the time. And that is the word root. What is a root of a polynomial, or in other words, a root of a function? Well, I say if f of x is a polynomial, r is said to be a root of f of x if f of r equals zero. So this is the definition of a root. It means if you have a number r, which is said to be the root, uh, it is a root because it makes the function zero when you plug it in. So for example, you know that you know how it's just doing x squared plus 7x plus 10? And I think one of the x-intercepts was negative 2, right? So if you replace x with negative 2, so this is f of x, right? And now let, let me do f of negative 2. If I replace the x with that, well, let's just go ahead and do those computations, right? Negative 2 squared is 4. 7 times negative 2 is negative 14 plus 10. And you'll notice 4 minus 14 is negative 10. Added with 10 is, boop, 0. This is what it means to be a root. When you plug the number into the function, it evaluates to 0. It becomes 0. And naturally, this makes sense with x-intercepts because... Go back to my Desmos graph. At an x-intercept, the y value is zero, right? So that's kind of why they go hand in hand, right? A root is the number that when you plug it into a function, it makes it zero. An x-intercept is where it crosses the x-axis, which happens to be where the function is zero. So they're kind of like the same thing, right? Uh, and I'll say kind of like the same thing. So. Uh, we're going to be interested in roots. We'll talk more about roots and like why we're interested in them, how they're used later. But for now, you just you're familiar with the word, you know the definition, and you know that factored form tells you the roots. Okay, we are going to get into the math in a moment. I know I've been just yapping. Uh, you say stop yapping, Mr. Spake. Um, but there's a few things I wanted to a few last comments about this before proceeding. Uh, and that's these useful things to know. Um, I'm not going to totally read through all of this, okay? I would just pause the video and take a moment to read this. Um, the, the few things I'm going to point out is the A value. You see that A value and that A value and that A value? Those are all the same number. They're all the same A. That's actually why we use A for all three forms. Uh, this leading coefficient is the co it is the leading term for all of these. Yeah, so that's something to point out. Um, meaning, if you know the a value in vertex form, then you know the a value in standard, and you know the a value in factor. Yeah, um, we just talked about that x intercepts are the roots, uh, and something about if your roots are not integers, right? So, for example, you could have a parabola that passes through, you know, like if, if I say, ooh, parabola, and it passes through three halves, right? Um, when we say factorization, like if I say 20 and I say factorize this, you say four times five, or you say two times 10, or you say one times 20, right? But you don't really usually say 2.5 times, uh, what? <laughs> Actually, what is it, 8? Yeah. You don't really say 2.5 times 8. Uh, even though 20 divided by 2.5 is 8, we wouldn't typically say that 2.5 is a factor of 20 because when we talk about factors, we're trying to restrict ourselves to integers or whole numbers, right? The same kind of goes for polynomial factorization. So, for example, this guy right here... Uh, you could, this is, this is technically the factored form I've written with a times x minus root 1, x minus root 2, right? Uh, where a half, or I guess, yeah, one, positive 1 half is root 1, 
and negative 3, because it's x minus, right? x minus negative 3 becomes x plus 3. Uh, so you have two roots, a half and a, and a negative 3, and then this coefficient that's out in the front is 2. Uh, this is fine and valid, but when you're doing the factoring that we talked about last class, you're going to end up with this, yeah, where the 2 is not on the outside. And you don't need to take out the 2 here because when we're doing factoring, we kind of like to stay with integers. It's just the thing we do. It's, there's, it's not to say that you can't, right? This, uh, the, having a root as a half, totally valid, absolutely, right? Um, but I would say that this is maybe the more, just the standard way to write factors, yeah? And, and that's it, okay? Uh, the last thing is two shortcuts to find vertex form. Uh, I don't really care if you know this bottom one. This one's just kind of a nice little treat. Uh, it's not something you're going to be tested on, but it's a, it's kind of a cool idea. Um, I'd encourage you to, to revisit this once you learn a little bit more about quadratics to really deepen that understanding. But we are going to use one of these shortcuts in this video, and that is uh, from standard form you can find the x-coordinate vertex by using this little equation right here. h equals negative b over 2a. I will model this later, but to kind of show you it in action, um, let, you know, I had this, this function that I, I just created in Desmos, right? If I say h is negative b over 2a, well, I say negative b. So I wish I could highlight my Desmos here, but, you know, it's AX squared plus BX plus C, and I'm, I'm trying to point at this. You see this? You see my little cursor here, right? The B value is 7. So that's like saying negative 7 over 2A. The A value is 1. So that's saying it's 2 times 1 on bottom. So that tells me negative 3.5 is where the vertex is. Meaning, or I should say, that's the axis of symmetry. It's the x value. So if you click this, hey, look at the x coordinate, right? Zoom in for you. Negative 3.5 is the axis of symmetry. It's, right, you can even write it, x equals negative 3.5. Oh my heavens. And there it is, right? Boom. So uh, this shortcut, I'll, I'll, again, I'll show it later. And as we progress through the class, I will we will eventually discover why this shortcut works. But for the purpose of this video and just getting you acclimated with these three forms, just know it as a shortcut. Okay, uh, we're going to get started with the problem, but I wanted to talk about how are we going to convert between the three forms, because that's the goal of this video. Um, getting from vertex form to standard form, and sort of just converting between all three. I say, well, if you want to get from vertex to standard, this is actually pretty easy. All you have to do is distribute and combine like terms, okay? Uh, vertex form, this is just something getting squared. So if you had like a times, or like x plus two squared plus one, maybe I make that at like an eight, right? Then I would take x plus 2 and square it, meaning take x plus 2 and multiply it by itself, then take the 8 and multiply that, and then add the 1, right? And if I do all that, I will end up with standard form, because the standard form is just everything all foiled out. That's how some teachers might say it. Uh, factored form is actually the same thing. If you had factored form and you wanted to find standard form, you would just multiply it, meaning you would just use distribution, and then any like terms you have, you combine those. And it's literally the same thing. You would, you would multiply all of these things, sorry, x times x, x times r2, blah, 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 and then you take the a and multiply everything, and that would lead you to standard form. Now, to get from standard form to factored form, well, believe it or not, you just factor. And so that's how you do that one. 
Uh, so the factoring techniques in the last video is how you get from there to there. Uh, and then the last one, getting from standard to vertex. Well, two things. Number one, shortcut, uh, which is what we're going to use in this video. Number two is an algebraic technique that's not a shortcut. It's actually where the shortcut comes from, and it's called completing the square. Now, in this video, we are not going to talk about completing the square. That is actually lesson 4.2. So in lesson 4.2, we're going to talk about this technique, uh, which means it might be worth revisiting these notes after you've done 4.2 as well, because you could do some of these problems again with that new knowledge. Today, however, I'm just going to show you the shortcut and how that works, okay? Okay, let's move on to the next thing. So, an example, and it's a bit of a lengthy example, and we haven't even done anything mathy, right? Um, but to be honest, up to this point, I've pretty much explained everything you need to know uh, what I might encourage is that you do the rest of these notes, try them on your own, because in class they're meant as, notice it says, investigation. It was never an example for me to just tell you how to do. It was something for you to explore, to talk about with others and think about, chew on this information uh, to see if you can figure it out. Really, all that stuff, I don't even know, have I been talking 20, 30 minutes? Holy goodness. However long I've been talking, that's it. Um, the rest of it is sort of exploratory and taking that info and developing new ideas using it. But I will walk through all of these so you have an understanding of how to work through them, okay? So this first example basically says, it doesn't really tell us anything. It just says, hey, here's a graph of a parabola. What's vertex form? What's standard form? What's factored form? Um, and thinking, okay, where could I start? What information am I given here? Well, I'm actually given a lot. Um, I, f first of all, I see immediately the x-intercepts, right? The x-intercepts are at negative 3 and negative 1. And if I go back to the previous page and I look at these three forms, uh, let's see, which one of these three has anything to do with x-intercepts? Well, x-intercepts are roots... So this is going to tell me what factored form is, right? Uh, and so what I could say here, uh, I kind of know factored form. Factored form is y equals a times x minus r1, x minus r2, right? And so I could say is y equals a, I don't know the a value, but it's x minus negative 3 and x minus negative 1. But of course, we wouldn't really usually write it like, right, a double negative makes a positive. So I might more nicely write this as x plus 3, x plus 1, right? Um, but I don't know the a value, so, hmm, not sure. Uh, let's see what else we can figure out from this. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about the a value in a moment. Uh, I see a y-intercept at negative 6. And standard form tells me stuff about the y-intercept because standard form is y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And the c value is the y-intercept. So I do know that it's y equals ax squared plus bx minus 6. Now, I don't know b and I don't know a. And incidentally, this a is the same as this a. So if I found a, then I could replace it in both of those. Uh, and the other one is vertex form. And I see the vertex here at negative 1, comma, negative 8. So vertex form says y equals ax minus h squared plus k. So if I plug in h, comma, k, where h, comma, k equals negative 1, comma, negative 8, then I should get y equals a times x minus negative 1, which would write as plus 1, and then a minus 8 like this. And so just from the picture of the parabola, this is, this is all the information I'm able to deduce, right? I know the vertex, I know the y-intercept, and I know the roots because those are the x-intercepts. 
but the rest of the information I'm going to have to find out somehow by really thinking about what I'm looking at here. Now, you'll notice in all three forms, I'm going to erase all these, they all have A in it, and we don't know what A is. So how do we find A? I say, well, here's one way you could find A. In vertex form, we say y equals a times x plus 1 squared minus 8, right? Now, this is a function, and this entire curve is f of x, right? This whole thing is f of x, or, you know, you could call it y, because it's y equals the quadratic, right? I say, well... Uh, uh, any point on here, like let's say, hey, uh, you have uh, what? This guy right here? Oh, by the way, that's not a negative one, is it? I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Hold on. I'm fixing that. You, hopefully you were yelling at me through the screen saying, Mr. Spake. That x-intercept is a positive one, so that should have said x minus 1. I'm so dreadfully sorry. So, so, so sorry. Okay, anyway, back to what I was saying. Uh, you could pick any point on here. I'm going to pick this one, which is 0, comma, negative 6. Any point on here can be generalized as x, comma, y. So uh, I'm going to come over here and say, well, here's y and here's x. And I'm going to say that x, comma, y is... 0 comma negative 6. So the y value is going to become negative 6, and the x value is going to become 0. And the rest of it's the same, right? a x plus 1 squared minus 8. And let's just do some math here. Negative 6 is negative 6. 0 plus 1 is 1, and then squared is 1. So this is just a times 1 minus 8. And then if I add 8 to both sides... I get 2. Ta-da! A is 2. So I can replace this A with a 2. I can replace this A with a 2. And I can replace this A with a 2. And I am done. Right? Cool, cool, cool. Uh, I'm s Now, notice this actually ended up handling both vertex form and factored form. So the only thing that's missing is that missing B value in standard form. So how, we talked about how do you get from standard form? Well, earlier we said, if you had vertex, you can distribute to get standard. Or if you had factored, you could distribute to get standard. So we actually have both, which means you can use either. Uh, let's do vertex form. So vertex form is y equals 2 times x plus 1 squared minus 8. Let's go ahead and square that. That's x plus 1 times itself. And so that's 2. Now, OK, it depends on how you'd like to do your distribution. Because uh, some students, I don't, it depends on what you want to do. Do you want to multiply the 2 into this and then take that and multiply it to this? or do you want to distribute these two binomials in their own sort of brackets and then distribute two? I'm actually in the habit of distributing the binomials first. So what I'm going to do here is inside here, I'm going to do x times x, x times 1, plus 1 times x, plus 1 times 1. Go ahead, do that distribution. You should end up with x squared plus 2x plus 1. And then don't forget the minus 8 out here. And if I distribute the 2, because it's multiplying, it's 2x squared plus 4x plus 2, and then the minus 8 at the end. And of course, the end terms are 2 minus 8, so it's 2x squared plus 4x minus 6. And you might notice, hey, howdy, 2 and 2 negative 6 and negative 6, so this b value should be 4, right? That's my takeaway. The b value is 4. And if you were to do it with factored form, you get the same thing. 
uh, I can show you just a side, it, like, it'll take me just a few seconds. 2 times x plus 3, x minus 1. If you do the distribution, you should get uh, 2 times x squared plus 2x minus 3. And then if you distribute the 2, lo and behold, you get the same thing. Okay? So it doesn't matter. You can do either form, whatever. Uh, and it's just going to depend on the information you're given. If you're given the x-intercepts, then you should start with factored form. Right? But if you're only given the vertex, well, you should start with vertex form. Uh, and also, just by the way, if you didn't know the roots, if you, know, if you couldn't see the x-intercepts for some reason, you could factor standard form. 2x squared plus 4x minus 6. So if you factor this, uh, there's a multitude of ways. Always look at for GCF first, so you can pull the 2 out and get x squared plus 2x minus 3. And then if you do your little x puzzle and you focus on, let me, let me do it in yellow here, okay? So that you really focus on just this. Forget about the 2 in front. You do negative 3 and 2, so then that's 3 and negative 1. So this guy, right, in these parentheses, right, you, you would say, okay, it's x squared x squared plus 3x minus x minus 3. Group like so. And then do GCF, x times x plus 3 minus 1 times x plus 3. And then this would factor as x minus 1, x plus 3. But this whole time, that was all factoring just what's in those blue brackets, right? So all of this was just sort of factored. And there was always a 2 out here to start with. So hence, the answer is 2 times x minus 1 times x plus 3, just as like we have it right there. OK? Nice. So this example just kind of hits everything. It's literally it's going between all three forms, showing you a variety of ways in which you can do that. OK? OK. I'm going to take a moment to drink some water. Oh. I'm all out of water. I guess I will not take this moment. I will say, <sighs> a breath. Okay, let's continue. So there's three more little things to do in the, uh, these investigations. And this is where uh, you really get pushed to think, cr think, think critically about the math that we're doing uh, and the information that we know. And it also really challenges you to, it challenges your understanding of some stuff from unit one, how to read math, how to interpret things, and, and understand what a question is asking. Um, so I'm going to walk through these, but if, you, if this is your first time doing this, I'd recommend pausing the video. Give yourself 10 minutes for each of these investigations and see if you can get it in that time. If not, you know, but there you go. And you might be saying, Mr. Spake, you've already been tell just yapping for an hour. Well, I don't have another 30 minutes. And I say, that's okay. Don't just have fun. Yeah? Have fun. If you want to do it with me, do it with me. If you want to do it on your own, do it. Have fun with it. Okay. So here's investigation one. The goal is rewrite this function. It's given in, ooh, let's see here. This looks like a times x minus h squared plus k form. That's vertex form. So it looks like we're given a function in vertex form and asked to rewrite it in factored form. OK, so factored form, we want a times x minus uh, the roots, right? We want to fully factor it. But there's not really a way to really go from uh, vertex form to factored form. Okay, there kind of is, but I'm not going to tell you right now. Uh, there is a way to do it, but we're, you're not ready for it, okay? Uh, well, I mean, you kind of are, but whatever, whatever. That's not what I'm doing here. Um, what we got to do is take it from vertex, make it into standard, 
and then put it into factored. Yeah? So what that means we need to do is from vertex form, we need to distribute. And then from standard form, we need a factor. Okay? So that's sort of the process here. Use distribution of in standard form and then factor it to get factored form. Okay, cool. Well, we can do that. So I say it's negative 1 half x plus 1 squared. So this is just x plus 1 times itself. And uh, I can distribute x plus 1 to itself. So x times x is x squared plus 1 times x plus 1 times x is 2x plus 1 times 1 is 1. And then there's a plus 2 out here. Now multiply this by negative a half, negative one half x squared, negative a half times two x is negative two x. Sorry, no, no, no. My ap apology is negative x, and then negative a half times one is negative a half. And then there's a plus two out here, right? So I got this by distributing the negative half, and then I'm gonna add two to it. Negative one half plus two is, three halves, okay? So this stayed the same, this stayed the same, and negative a half plus two is three halves. Okay, so now this is in standard form, right? This is in standard form because it's ax squared plus bx plus c. The question now is to put it into factored form. Now notice, what is the a value? The a value is negative a half, right? So that means in factored form, I'm gonna say y equals negative a half, x minus the first root, x minus the second root. So what will I do here? I said, well, hmm. It has negative a half as a leading coefficient. If I want to factor this, well, I guess there's a couple ways. You could do an x puzzle right away with negative a half times three halves, but that's not gonna be very fun. <laughs> that's not gonna be very fun. Here's what I'll do instead. Let's take out the negative a half, meaning if I wrote negative a half on the outside, what would this stuff inside have to be? So uh, let, me, let me really, really call your attention to focus here, okay? I'm using a variety of colors. I am factoring out negative one-half. What does this polynomial need to be so that when I distribute negative a-half, I get this? And I say, well... The first term is negative one-half x squared. So I need a negative half times something, and that something is going to be x squared, because negative half times x squared is negative half squared. Now let's do the next one. The next term needs to be negative x, and you need to do negative a half times something, right? Negative a half times something gets me negative x. So what is that something? Well, I need an x here so that I'll get an x here. And negative a half times 2 makes 1. So it looks like that something needs to be 2x, or in other words, plus 2x. And then lastly, you have 3 halves here. So same thing. You're taking negative a half times something to get three halves, positive three halves. So it's negative a half times something equals three halves. Well, looks like you would just multiply by three, right? So it's plus three. Okay, so what does this accomplish? What, what is this doing? I said, well, look, it's y equals negative a half times x squared plus 2x plus 3. And this polynomial, x squared plus 2x minus 3, is easy to factor. So let's do it in yellow. Uh, if I did x squared plus 2x plus 3, 
that put a three up here and a two down here. Um, did I mess up something? I think it's minus three. I think that's that's my issue. That should be minus three. Okay. Yeah, because negative, because you need a plus, right? You need plus three halves, so you do negative times negative. That was my that was my error here. Sorry. There it is. Okay. So uh, let's say we got three and negative one. Three minus one is two, and three times negative one is three. So then this would factor as, I, I do grouping, say plus 3x minus x minus 3. Isn't that what we just did? Uh, x times x plus 3 minus 1 times x plus 3. And so then this is just x plus 3 times x minus 1. We already knew this from over here, right? It was the same factoring pattern. Uh, so it's this, but there's a negative a half in front of it. Pen? Hello? Wait a minute. Did my... Uh-oh. Okay. Is my, is my pencil okay? Hmm. Whew. Guys, I was going to freak out that this pencil wasn't working anymore. Oh, my God. You couldn't see Mr. Spake's face. Okay, anyway. Uh, we've done it. we factored it. Y is negative one-half times x plus 3, x minus 1. Done. Yeah, we did it. So what was the purpose of this problem? I say, well, it's, you know, it enhances your distribution skills, it promotes your factoring skills, but in particular, the reason this question was maybe more challenging than most factoring questions is because you had to factor out a fraction, right? And maybe this, isn't, maybe this is something you have experience with, maybe it's not. But if you have something like 1 3rd x squared plus 3x minus 2, and you say, well, what if I factor out 1 3rd? Then you're kind of like dividing by 1 3rd, meaning so you're kind of tripling everything. Everything in here, everything in here needs to be triple of what it was uh, of, of what this is in order so that when you do one-third of it, it goes away. Meaning you have one-third, so you triple one-third x squared becomes x squared. You triple 3x becomes 9x, and you triple negative 2, it becomes negative 6. And this is nice, and this works because one-third times x squared is one-third x squared, one-third times 9x is 3x, and one-third times negative 6 is negative 2. Okay? And that was the trick with this one half um, because it's, it's effectively doubling everything, right? If you take this and double it, you get that. If you take this and you double it and you take this and you double it, but it's not, it's not just doubling, it's also negative. So, okay, that one's, that, that's that. Let's move on to investigation two. And so this says rewrite f of x equals 3x squared minus 36x plus 113 in vertex form. Hint, use the shortcut h equals negative b over 2a. And then it says you can find k by evaluating f of h. Okay, this is a really great question to ask. Um, it, it's going to show us vertex form, but it's, it's going to do a little bit more than just that. Um, so we're given the quadratic in standard form here. And the hint says uh, you would like to write it in vertex form, which is f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k. Now the thing is we already know a, right? Because this 3 is a, so that a is 3. So all you need is h comma k. And what the hint says is you can find h comma k where uh, if you do h, you say, well, h is negative b over 2a. And it says you can find k by evaluating f of h. That, that means k is f of h. Yeah? Um, some students kind of get lost with this as to why this works 
So let me kind of attempt to explain. Um, this is the axis of symmetry. So H is the X coordinate of a vertex. Look, if you have a ver if you have a parabola like this, and it's H comma K, well the axis of symmetry is the X value. It's H, right? So it's right down the middle at the X coordinate H. Um, there is a reason this works. We will explore it later for now. Just trust me that it works. But then you say, well, how do you find K? Well, if you have a parabola like this, you could say that this is a point X comma Y. Uh, but we don't always call that X comma Y. Sometimes we say it's X comma F of X, right? Because the Y value, right? You know how we say Y is F of X? So then that's another way to express that point, x comma f of x. But if the point is called h comma k because it's a vertex, then just like it's x comma f of x, the x coordinate is h, but the y coordinate is what the function is at h, meaning it's f of h, yeah? So this is why k is f of h. A k is the y value when you plug in h, when you plug in the x value or the axis of symmetry. Okay, so that's why this works. Okay, this is why this strategy is, is going to help us or, or accomplish the problem. So it says h equals negative b over 2a, right? Well, those values come from standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c. And what I see here is that B is negative 36 and A is 3. So negative B over 2A, well, that's negative B over 2A, where B is negative 36 and A is 3. So that's a double negative. Negative negative 36 is positive 36 over 2 times 3 is 6. 36 divided by 6 is 6. So this means h is 6, okay? So when finding the vertex, h comma k, I know that the uh, x coordinate, h, is 6. But I still need to find k. And we said that you can find k by doing f of h, by taking h and plugging it into f. And some students, even, even though I've done all this explaining, they're still like, I mistake, I still don't get it. And I say, you got to go back to unit one. When we talked about function notation, and we talked about what it means to say f of something. So we have a function definition given to us. It's over here. It's right. It's literally here. f of x equals that. So I'm going to write this. f of x is 3x squared minus 36x plus 113. Now look, I, I kind of want to do like a Dora moment here, yeah? I'm, I'm going to pause, and you're going to read it out. You're going to say it out loud to the, to the screen uh, like you're a little toddler following along. f of x is 3x squared minus 3x plus 113. Can you say what f of 2 is? Good, it is 3 times 2x squared minus 36x times, sorry, 36 times 2 plus 113. Can you say what f of k is? Right, it is 3k squared minus 36k plus 113. Can you say what f of h is? Correct again. It's 3h squared minus 36h plus 113. So if you remember this from unit one, right? Anytime you say, when you say f of blah, 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 in the general function notation is f of x, it just means you're replacing the x's with whatever you have that you're substituting. So what we're interested in here is we know that k is f of h, right? And so that means it's 3h squared minus 36h plus 113. 
And I said, well, what is H? H is six. We actually just found that, right? We said, hey, right here, H, oh, there it is, H is six. So F of H means F of six, which means it's three times six squared minus 36 times six plus 113. Uh, and you could do some math here. You could say three times 36 minus 36 times six plus 113. Uh, and I'm, again, the expectation in this class is you could do this without a calculator. Um, you can multiply this by three and you can multiply this by six and then you can do this minus this plus this. But, uh, so you can, you know, if you want to pause the video, go ahead, do that and get that arithmetic out of the way. Go ahead, do that. Let me show you something cool. Uh, this is three times 36. This is six times 36. Meaning, this is three 36s minus six 36s. I'm going to say that again. This is three 36s minus six 36s. So how many 36s is that? It's three minus six, which is negative three 36s. And then we're gonna add that 113, yeah? So that's some way to kind of simplify the arithmetic here so that you don't have to do 36 times six, right? You can just say, oh, 36 times three, uh, that's 108. So this is negative 108 plus 113, which is 5, telling me k is 5. So h comma k is 6 comma 5. And if I go all the way back to where we were, I now know h is 5 and k, no, wait, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. h is 6 and k is five, and we're done, yeah? Uh, now it seemed kind of like a long process, but that's it's just because we did that little Dora segment, right? Um, this shortcut is actually really fast, and you do this a few times, you'll get pretty good at it. Uh, it's a pretty easy and useful shortcut to do. Uh, you literally just plug in the numbers to find a number, and then you take that number and you plug it in too. So you plug it back into the original function, do all the math, and you get the number. And you're done, yeah? And we're at vertex form. Now, uh, part B and C ask you to go further with this. So I say f of x is three x minus six squared plus five, right? What are the transformations? Well. The three is a vertical stretch. So we're stretching it by a factor of three. X minus six moves it right six. And plus five moves it up five. Yeah? And so that is, that's it. That's the transformations. Knowing the transformations, can you draw a quick little sketch, right? What does is, what is the sketch of F look like? Well, uh, let's make a little Cartesian plane like so. And the parent function parabola looks something like this, right? Well, what is the new parabola going to look like? I'm going to do it in yellow, right? Well, it's right 6. So I'm going to take the vertex, go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And I'm going to go up 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 meaning my new vertex is at 6 comma 5. And it's stretched, vertical stretch up, so it's going to get skinny. It's going to be, whoa, skinny. Nice and thin like that. And so this is not a super accurate graph, but it is a sketch of what we're interested in, in, in visualizing, right? It's, it's right 6 up 5, and it's stretched up upwards. Um, looking at this, it asks another question. Based off your graph here, and we don't need the red anymore, does F have one real root, two real roots, or no real roots? 
You say, huh? What? What? What does that mean? Well, a root, as discussed earlier, is like an x-intercept, right? Because what is a root? It says, well, a root is, if it, r is a root if f of r is zero. That basically means y equals zero. That basically means it's an x-intercept. So does this function ever touch the x-axis? I said, no, right? Does not touch x-axis. Therefore, what does that mean? You say, well, that means it has no roots. And I say, well, careful there. That means it has no real roots. Yeah? No real roots because there's no x-intercept, right? It does not touch it. There's no x-intercepts, so we have no real roots. And you might say, well, do you have fake roots? And then I would say, yes. But they're not called fake roots. They're called non-real roots. And that is lesson 4.3. <laughs> but we are not there yet. Yeah? This is 4.1, and we're not talking about non-real roots yet. Okay? So you can see no x-intercepts, no real roots. Done. Yeah? If it had two real roots, two real roots means it would cross twice. If it had one real root, it would cross once or it wouldn't even cross it would just the vertex would hit it on the x-axis one time okay that would be one real root okay let's move on we're almost there i know it's a long video uh and now we're on investigation three uh so again you can pause read through this and try it on your own but here is the walkthrough so it says let f of x be a quadratic function such that f of 3 equals f of 7 equals 0, and f of 4 equals 6. Now, part A says, what is special about the fact that f of 3 is 0 and f of 7 is 0? And knowing that, what do we know about the graph of f, right? So it's just given information. That's all it's told us is that a function evaluated at 3 Whatever that number is, it's also equal to the function evaluated at 7, and they actually both come out to 0. So what's special about this fact? Well, if you'd like to really pause and, and truly think about it, it's, it would be better that you think about it before I just give you away the answer. Uh, so go ahead, pause, think about it. Here's what the answer is to this question. Why is this special? Well, go back to the front page. And you know that definition I said you should highlight and star right here? It says if f of x is a polynomial, r is said to be a root of f if f of r is 0. You see that piece right there? f of r equals 0. Go back. This says f of 3 equals 0. f of 7 equals 0. So r is a root if f of r equals 0. So what does this mean? If f of 3 equals 0 and f of 7 equals 0? I say, well, uh, since f of 3 equals 0, then the value x equals 3 is a root of f of x. Likewise, since f of 7 equals 0, then x equals 7 is the other root. Yeah, x equals 7 is also a root. Okay? That's the takeaway. That's why this is special. Because, remember, a root is when you plug it in, the function comes out to 0. So these roots are 3 and 7. What does that tell us about the graph of f? Well, as we were, we were kind of just talking about this with no real roots, right? Roots are like x-intercepts, right? If a real root will appear as an x-intercept. So this is saying that you have a root at 3 and a root at 7. So that's two x-intercepts. So I would say, what do we know about the graph of f? Uh, the graph 
of f has x-intercepts at, what are the points? Because intercepts are, are points, coordinates, 3 comma 0 and 7 comma 0. Yeah? And that's, that's the takeaway from this. This question's really important because maybe I don't ask you something like this quite on the test, but I might give you something like this and seeing that you need to know and recognize that this statement, this math statement, means that 3 and 7 are roots. Therefore, they're x-intercepts. Yeah? Part B asks to make a table representing these points on a graph of f uh, and then sketch it. So we, kind of, we already have two points. The x and the both x-intercepts, 3, 0 and seven zero. And so like on my little graph here, I could say three zeros about here and seven zeros about here, right? Um, but it's asking if I know a third point. And I say, well, where do I get a third point from? Say, well, f of this is zero, this is zero. So that's two things. I also have f of four is six. Remember, f of x is our y value. So when you say f of 4 equals 6, f of x equals y is referring to an ordered pair x, y. So f of 4 equals 6 is referring to an ordered pair 4, 6. x is 4, y is 6. So we actually have a coordinate 4, 6, right? And so zooming in here, 4, 6 might be right about there. Yeah? Now... Uh, just knowing these three points, it asks, does the parabola point upwards or downwards based off this info? Well, look at it. What do you think? Up or down? I said, well, it's got to connect through this point, but then it also has to come back down to hit this. So it's got to be downwards, right? It's got to be something like that. So that's my parabola, and I know it faces down. Uh, and an astute student will notice, uh, since it's downwards, the a value, right, which is the lead coefficient, is negative. This is because uh, ax minus a, right? The a value is the vertical stretch factor. And how do you vertically reflect it? You reflect it if it's negative, right? Negative x squared. That will reflect it upside down. Okay. Part C says find the factor form equation using this information. Uh, and this is something we've, we've already kind of practiced, but it, it's just hitting it again here. So factored form is a times x minus root 1, x minus root 2, right? Um, and so, well, I know my roots, right? My roots are 3 and 7. And so the only thing I'm really trying to find here uh, that's, that's left unknown is the A value. So how will I find the A value? Well, I need to... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm yawning. This, this video is long. <laughs> Um, that's okay. I, I hope I'm not scaring anyone away. I hope people actually click on this, considering the time length. Uh, so you have three, you have seven, right? You need to find A, which means you need to get rid of this X and Y, because these are unknown right now. You need to plug in something that you know. Well, X comma Y is literally just a coordinate. And we have a coordinate called 4, 6. So let's make x4 and make y6, because this is going to be true. This point, we know, lies on the parabola, because it was given. So the y value is 6, and both those x's become 4. So do some arithmetic here. 4 minus 3 is 1. 4 minus 7 is negative 3. This implies that 6 equals negative 3 times a. So if you divide both sides by negative 3, you get 
negative 2 for the a value. So what does this mean? Uh, it just means I, I rewrite this whole thing. y equals the a value is negative 2, and then it's x minus 3, x minus 7. Done. Okay? And we are good. We say, yay, a smiley face. Hello. Okay. Part D. This is the last stretch here for this video. Um, and this connects back to unit three. It says, if you know at least three points on a parabola, you can use a system of equations to find standard form. This one's kind of hard to do on your own. Uh, if you want to try it, go ahead. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and explain it now. It says, uh, again, I'm going to reread it. If you know at least three points, you can use a system of equations, right? A system of equations to find standard form. That's ax squared plus bx plus c. How do you do so? I say I'll show you now. It's, it's written here, but I'm just going to write it for you now. Standard form says y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And if I want to write standard form, that means I'm looking for a, b, and c. That means this equation has three unknowns, three unknowns that I'm interested in solving for. And coming off the tail end of unit three, we just learned that if you have three unknown quantities and you want to solve for those, all you need is three equations. So then the question is, what are these three equations and how do we get them? And the way you get them is, uh, this equation is what we're going to use, Why standard form equation. So we're going to use the standard form equation to get these three equations. But we have three points. So let me erase some of this. I have three points. The first is the x-intercept 3, 0, and then 7, 0, and then 4, 6. Now let's, let's just focus on this first point. x is 3, y is 0. So on this equation that I've written in red, y is 0, and x is 3. So notice what I just did there. I replaced all the x's with 3, and I replaced the y with 0. This gets me 0 equals 3 squared is 9, so that's 9a plus 3b plus c. And that is equation 1. But if I had two more equations, then I'd have a system of equations with three variables that I could solve, meaning I want another ABC and I want another ABC. How will I get this? Well, I'll just do the same thing I just did. Uh, the first point I used was 3, 0, right? So I've used this one. Let's check that off, go back, and let's do 7, 0 now. So x will be 7 and y will be 0. So then, uh, if I do that, well, this y is still 0. So I'll erase the x and y's, right? This y is still 0, but x is now 7 here and here. And then I do the, the little arithmetic. 7 squared is 49, and then that's 7b, so that's just 7b. So the second equation is 49a plus 7b plus c equals 0. Now for the third equation, I'm going to replace the x's again. Okay. And I've already used, I've used this one. So the last remaining one is this, 4, 6. x is 4, y is 6. So y is 6, and the x's are 4's. So then 6 equals a times 4 squared, that's 16, and then a 4 here. 
So the last equation is 16a plus 4b plus c equals 6. Okay? That's your system of equations. So let me lasso this. And I'm going to bring this down here. Boop. That's my system of equations. Yeah? It's three unknowns, so I need three equations. What can I do with this? <laughs> I can make an augmented matrix. If I had a calculator, I could say, ooh, ooh, this is 9, 3, 1, 0, 49, 7, 1, 0, 16, 4, 1, 6. Ta-da! And since we just came off unit 3, uh, if you if you got to go review how to do this with a calculator, you can go do so. But we can use the graphing calculator to find row reduced echelon form of this augmented matrix. And that will tell us the values of A, B, C. So let's see here. Do I have time? Well, <laughs> video is already long enough, huh? Uh, do I have do I have my little... Uh... No, we're not going to play Plague, Inc. We're not going to watch Adult Swim either. Where's my little app? There it is. Okay. Do, 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 do. Second matrix. Edit. Let's make a three by four matrix. Uh, I believe it was nine, three, one, zero. And then I think it was 49, seven, one, zero. And then 16, four, one, six. So let's quit out of that, go back to matrix, math, row reduced echelon form of matrix A. Enter. Ta-da! And so I have row reduced echelon form giving me that negative 2, 20, and negative 42. That's corresponding with A, B, C. So, go back. A is negative 2, B is 20. C is negative 42, right? That, that is what we had, right? Yep, okay. So A is negative 2, B is 20, C is negative. So that means standard form is negative 2x squared plus 20x minus 42. Done. Nice. So this is a really cool strategy using what we've learned from the previous unit, unit 3, with systems of equations using technology to solve. Um, I'm going to ask you how to demonstrate, you know, you are going to be asked to demonstrate this skill on quiz and test, but you'll be given a calculator to do so, yeah? We've covered substitution elimination. It's fine. We, we, you've, we've been tested on it. We're cool. We're good. Now we're just using that knowledge to solve problems, new problems, right? New problems that we're interested in figuring out. So, uh, now in number four, it says in part C, you found the factored equation. So this is just to connect the idea that it's literally all the same. We had our factored equation right here, negative two times X minus three, X minus seven. So look at this, negative two, X minus three, X minus seven. Distribute this, you get X squared minus, uh, was that 10 X plus 21. And then to distribute the negative two, you get negative two X squared plus 20 X minus 42. Oh my goodness. It's the same thing. Yeah. Awesome. Guys, isn't math just epic? Isn't it just honestly sick? It is epic, it is sick, it is dope. It is de demure. It is fantastic. It is phenomenal. I mean, it's just awesome. I mean, that's, that, that's what I'd say. Math is awesome. What a great video. Oh my gosh, it took us forever, but it's just chock full. I mean, you could just look at that. 
oh my gosh, it's like a movie. It's like a movie of math. You are welcome. Okay, I hope you enjoyed watching this. I hope it was helpful. Uh, I know I talk a little bit slow with this, but uh, I wanted to be really methodical in my explanation for every one of these problems so that if you're stuck on any of this, I'm hoping that this as a resource will kind of help you out. Because, uh, look, I'm going to admit, these questions I've asked here are pretty, pretty cognitively demanding. They're, you really have to think about it. They, they don't just come naturally to everybody, right? Um, and I did a fair amount of talking at the beginning about this junk. So anyway, hope it was useful. Uh, if you're struggling with this stuff, come see me for tutorials. Happy to help you out because uh, there's a lot of stuff in this unit. Uh, but you guys are doing great, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Take care.